uh, we look at uh, afternoon session uh, on the suttas called Pariyaya Suttas from the Sanyute Nikaya 46, uh, Suttas 52. Calms Bhikkhu abandons the five hindrances, the corruption of the mind that weaken wisdom and develop correctly the seven factors of enlightenment. So this morning, we have seen the Pancha Nivarana. Okay, it's the five hindrances. So today we move on to see the seven factors of enlightenment. Um, okay, so we go straight to the suttas. Uh, Pariyaya means the exposition, method of exposition. So some wanderers tell uh, some Buddhist monks, uh, oh, heretics, uh, tell the Buddhist monk that they to teach the five hindrances and the seven evocating factors. So what is the difference? Uh, the Buddha explained by giving a detailed analytical treatment that he says uh, is beyond the scope of the wanderers. So I should read out the whole text. It's not that long, uh, so we can read this slowly. Then, in the morning, a number of bhikkhus dressed and taking their bows and ropes entered Savati for arms. Then it occurs to them. It is still too early to walk for arms in Savati. So let us go to the park of the wanderers of the other sex. Then those bhikkhus went to the park of the wanderers of other sex. They exchanged greeting with those wanderers and when they have concluded their greeting and cordial talk, they sat down on one side. The wanderers then said to them, friend, the ascetic Gautama teachers, teach us the Dharma to his disciples but us comes because abundant wisdom and develop correctly the seven factors of enlightenment. We too teach the Dharma to our disciples thus. Come, friends, abandon the seven, abandon the five hindrances, the corruption of the mind that weaken wisdom, and develop correctly the seven factors of enlightenment. So, friends, what here is the distinction, the disparity, the di difference between the ascetic Gautama and us? That is, regarding the one Dharma teaching and the other, regarding the one manner of instruction and the others. Then those because they neither delighted in or nor rejected the statement of those wanderers, without delighting in it, without rejecting it, they rose from their seats and left, thinking we shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the Blessed One. Then, when those bhikkhus had walked for alms in Sawati and had returned from the alms round after their meal, they approached the Blessed One. Having paid homage to him, they sat down to one side and reported to him the entire discussion between those wanderers and themselves. The Blessed One said, Because when wanderers of other sex speaks but does, that should be asked, Friend, is there a method of exposition by means of which the five hindrances become ten, and the seven factors of enlightenment become fourteen? Being asked thus, those wanderers would not be able to reply, and further, they would meet with vexation. For what reason? Because they, that would not be within their domain. I do not see anyone, because in this world, with these devas, Mara and Brahma, in this generation, with its ascetics and Brahmans, its devas and humans, who could satisfy the mind with an answer to those questions, except the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, 
or one who has heard it from them. The first part, the, the fight becomes tense. And what bhikkhus is a method of exposition by means of which the five hindrances become tame. Whatever sensual desire there is for, in, for the internal is a hindrance. Whatever sensual desire there is for the external is also a hindrance. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as a hindrance of sensual desire becomes, by this method of exposition, twofold. Whatever ill will there is towards the internal is a hindrance. Whatever ill will there is towards the external is also a hindrance. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as a hindrance or ill will becomes, by this method of exposition, twofold. Whatever sloth there is, is a hindrance. Whatever topos there is, is also a hindrance. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as a hindrance of sloth and topo becomes, by this method of exposition, twofold. Whatever restlessness there is, is a hindrance. Whatever remorse there is, is also a hindrance. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as a hindrance of restlessness and remorse becomes, by this twofold of exposition, by this method of exposition, twofold. Then whatever doubts there is about the internal is a hindrance. Whatever doubts there is about the external is also hindrance. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as a hindrance of doubts becomes, by this method of exposition, twofold. Now we look at the second part. The seven Satabhajanga become 14. And what because is a method of exposition by means of which the seven factors of enlightenment becomes 14. Whatever mindfulness there is of things internal, is the enlightenment factors of mindfulness. Whatever mindfulness there is of thing external is also the enlightenment factors of mindfulness. Thus, what is spoken of concisely is the enlightenment factors of mindfulness becomes by this method of exposition twofold. So the first one is the mindfulness. And the second, whenever one discriminate things internally with wisdom. Examine them, make an investigation of them. That is the enlightenment factors of discrimination of states. Whenever one discriminates things externally with wisdom, examine them, make an investigation of them. There is Enlightenment factors of discrimination of states. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as the enlightenment factors of discrimination of states becomes by this method of exposition twofold. Third, whatever bodily energy there is, is the enlightenment factors of energy. Whatever mental energy there is, is also the. Thus, what is spoken of concisely? as the enlightenment factor of energy becomes by this method of exposition, twofold. Four, whatever rapture there is accompanied by thought and examination is the enlightenment factors of rapture. Whatever rapture there is without thought and examination is also the enlightenment factors of rapture. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as the enlightenment factors of rapture becomes by this, two met, by this method of exposition twofold. Whatever tranquility of body there is, is the enlightenment factors of tranquility. 
viable tranquility of mind there is, is also the enlightenment factors of tranquility. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as the enlightenment factors of tranquility becomes by this method of exposition twofold. <clears throat> Number six, no? whatever concentration there is accompanied by thought and examination is, is the enlightenment factors of concentration. Whatever concentration there is without thought and examination is also the enlightenment factors of concentration. Thus, what is, what is spoken of concisely as the enlightenment factors of concentration becomes by this method of exposition, twofold. So the last one, whatever equanimity there is regarding things internal is the enlightenment factors of equanimity. Whatever equanimity there is regarding things external is also the enlightenment factors of equanimity. Thus, what is spoken of concisely as the enlightenment factors of equanimity becomes by this method of exposition. Twofold. This because is a method of exposition by means of which the seven factors of enlightenment becomes 14. So now we look at a knot by Bhikkhu Bodhis. He noted uh, in, from the Sarata Pakasini, it's a commentary of the Majjhima Nikaya about internal and external. Okay, I think a bit uh, small. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So you see the sensual desire yeah, for the internal. It says, "Ah, uh, body." It said, "Is desire for one's own fine aggregates, and for the external, is the desire for the aggregates of others, and also, uh, no doubts for inanimate object." object. It says similar below, below ill will towards internal might be understood as anger directed towards oneself. Ill will towards the external as anger directed to other beings and to external conditions. And similarly to doubts, doubts about the internal, according to Sarata Pakasini, is uncertainty regarding one's own five aggregates whether they are truly impermanent, etc. Doubts about the external is a great doubt. Maha Vichikicca about eight matters, about the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the morality, uh, the past, present, and future, and dependent origination. Okay, so we just uh, look at these suttas and then now, I want to move on. That's, uh, you know, the right effort, uh, the, or the four great interview. And these two kinds of mental states, uh, as we have seen earlier this morning, the unwholesome mind, as well as the wholesome mind, that has, uh, you know, they have two tasks. Uh, for the unwholesome states, Akusala Dhamma, it refers to the five hindrances. And then the first task is to prevent five hindrances from arising and the second is to abandon the already present active five hindrances. So now we move on to see the wholesome step, Kusala Dhamma, and it refer to the state of mind untainted by defilements, especially those conducing uh, to, uh, uh, to deliberate, such as seven factors of awakening or enlightenment. And the first task is to bring into beings, uh, into being the undeveloped liberating factors. Okay, bring it up. And the second is to persistently develop those wholesome mind to its maturity. So now we have these four, yeah, four endeavors. For the first two is for the unwholesome sense of mind, where you have to prevent it and abandon, abandon them. Huh? 
And the second is for the wholesome state of mind that to arouse the wholesome state of mind that have not yet arisen. And of course, to maintain, yeah, and to develop uh, the wholesome states of mind that has already arisen. Yeah. So this is, now we look from this perspective. Um, now we look at the first one, is that to prevent the arising of the unarisen wholesome state. So now uh, we shall examine each of these uh, you know four, four divisions of right effort and this is the first one it says that a disciple rouses his will to avoid the arising of evil unwholesome states that have not yet arisen and he makes an effort stir up his energy exert his mind and strike and this one is from the Anguttar Nikaya so um, you see the first one, they are the unwholesome states of mind. Uh, generally, we call their hindrances because they block the path to liberation. And the first two hindrances, yeah, um, the sensual desire, you know, and ill will, they are the strongest, uh, the most powerful barriers uh, to the meditative growth. Um, they are representing, uh, uh, respectively, the unwholesome root of greed and aversion. The other three hindrances, uh, um, you know, Tinamidda, Udacha Kukucha, and Vichikicha, you see, they are less toxic, but still they are obstructive. Uh, they are the, the offshoots of delusion, and usually they are in association with other defilements. Okay, so we do a review. Uh, okay, now the second one to abandon uh, the arisen unwholesome states. So it says that a disciple rouses his will to overcome the evil, unwholesome states that have already arisen, and he makes an effort, stir up energy, exert his mind, and strike. So this is called in Pali, Pahana Padhana. Huh? Tuan, tuan, huh? It means that you make an effort to abandon the arisen, unwholesome states. And the Buddha taught us to restrain our senses and to guard our senses, our sense faculties, so that unwholesome dharmas such as defilements uh, will not arise. But there are unwholesome defilements still arise. That is because this defilement swell up from the death of the mental continuum, which accumulated from the past, and they arise as unwholesome thoughts and emotion. So when this happens, an effort to abandon them becomes so necessary. So this is what in Pali called Pahana, Padhana. It means that the effort to abandon the arisen unwholesome states. Okay, I hope it made clear. And there are these five techniques, okay, for expelling uh, default. And we have seen this also in the morning, but I just only, re uh, you know, go through once again. So, you see, it's, it says in the Majjima, this one is from the Majjima Nikaya, uh, and there is a simile. It just says a skilled physician it has a different medicine for different ailments. So the Buddha also has a different antidotes for different hindrances. And some equally applicable to all, and some geared to a particular hindrance. So in this Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha explained five techniques for expelling the defiled thought. So these are the five. To expel the defiled thought with a wholesome thought, which is it's exact opposite. We shall look at it afterwards. Huh? And the second, the forces of shame, hurry, and moral dear, dread, huh? or tapta. And the third, deliberate uh, diversion of attention. And the fourth is confrontation. And the fifth is separation. So this is another antidote huh, given in the Majjima Nikaya. So we shall look at them. Huh? 
So the first one is to expel the default thought with the wholesome thought, which is uh, X exact opposite. And there are these five antidotes. Say, for example, antidotes for a desire. So it says to counteract desire, meditation on impermanent um, is quite appropriate. Yeah? It is because of our seeing things upside down, is, you know, we presume there is um, permanent, everlasting entity. Therefore, the Buddha teaches us the practice of, of impermanent. So we see those objects of clinging are of the nature of clinging. They are not stable, and hence our mind will become settled and calm. There another method of antidotes for desire, that is the contemplation of foulness of the body. So that is the contemplation of the unattractive nature of the body. So these are the antidotes uh, uh, for the Kamachanda given by the Majjhima Nikaya. And now we look at another antidotes. Uh. Uh, of course, the best antidotes for the ill will is the meditation of loving kindness, yeah? metta, and which banishes all traces of anger and hatred through a systematic radiation of the altruistic wish that all beings be free from affliction, be free from hostility, uh, be free from anxiety. Uh, may they attain their own happiness. So we used to chant like Sabbe Sata Avera Hondu, Abhya Paja Hondu, Anigha Hondu, Suki Atanang Pari Harandu. May all beings, may they be free from affliction, be free from hostility, be free from anxiety, may they maintain their own happiness. So this is you know, the, the metta chan. And the third antidotes for the dullness and drowsiness. Uh, so the spelling of dullness and drowsiness call uh, um, for, a, you know, special effort to arouse the energy uh, and for which several methods are, are, are suggested. For example, the visualization of a brilliant ball of light, you know, to awaken the mind of ignorance, getting up and doing a period of breeze walking meditation also, and reflection on death, uh, or simply make a firm determination uh, to continue striving. So this probably, you know, that helps uh, to overcome the, the dullness and drowsiness. Now we look at number four, antidotes for restlessness and worry. Uh, restlessness and worry are yeah, effectively you know, counteracted you know, by turning the mind to mindfulness of in and out breathing. And this method helps effectively calming the mind down. Okay, uh, so yeah, all these antidotes, and, antidotes uh, they are proposed by you know, I mean, in the suttas, Majjhima Nikaya. And the fifth one is antidotes for doubts. Yeah? It means that, uh, you know, to make inquiry, yeah? ask questions, and study the teachings until the obscure points become clear. So it means that in the practice of meditation, you see, you cannot just sit there quietly with the understandings of the Dharma, right? You really have to you know, make an effort, you know, to study the dharmas, you know, to investigate the dharmas, to make inquiries, you know, to question and study the teachings until, you know, those things are clear to you. Yeah, so these are, um, yeah, the first one, uh, this is the five techniques for expelling the distracted thought. And now we look at the second one, the forces of shame and moral dread uh, to, or, or to abandon the distracting thought. So this is a method of the fear of shame and the fear of blame huh? to abandon the destructive, destructive thought. So one reflects on the thought 
uh, as shameful and blamable, or consider them as undesirable consequences that one expected. Yeah. So um, we had to, you know, continuously reflecting on it until you abandon them. So this is the second one. And the third, deliberate diversions of attention. So it involves. Huh? So when, a, when an unwholesome thought arises, instead of indulging it, one simply uh, shuts it out by redirecting one's attention, you know, elsewhere, as if uh, closing one's eyes and looking away to avoid the unpleasant sights. So this is purposely to, to, to divert, you know, the, your attention. And the fourth method is confrontational. This is approach confrontation. Instead of turning away from the unwholesome thought, you confront it directly as an object, scrutinize its features, and investigate its source. When this is done, the thought quiet down and eventually disappear. So it's like the unwholesome thought, unwholesome thought is like a theft, right? It only creates trouble when its operation is concealed or in secret. But when put under observation, it becomes tame and quiet down. And the last one, suppression, okay? So I think you understood uh, the word suppression. You suppressed, you know, those hindrances. Now, the Buddha says, okay, when applying this fine method, right, particular mentioned in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, with skill and description, one becomes a master of all the pathway of thought. So it says that one is no longer the subject of the mind, but its master. Then whatever thought uh, one wants to think, that one will think. Whatever thought one does not want to think, that one will not think. Even if unwholesome thought occasionally arise, one can dispel them immediately. So the third of the right effort is the aroused and arisen wholesome step. So this is something to do with arousing, you know, the wholesome mind, right? So now you look at it, the wholesome step to be developed, you know, bhavana, padahana, you see, there is this serenity and insight. It means that through the practice of samatha and vipassana, you see, then you have the, you know, particularly on the, the foundation of mindfulness, you know, through the practice of the noble effort part, eventually you lead to the enlightenment through the seven factors of enlightenment. So these are these are these are the path, right, leading to the enlightenment. So it's not, it's not other than the four foundation of mindfulness, noble effort path, and the seven factors of enlightenment. <clears throat> And the fourth, to maintain the arisen wholesome fat, wholesome states. Okay, so the disciple rouses his will to maintain the wholesome things that have already arisen and not to allow them to disappear, but to bring them to growth, to maturity, and to the full perfection of development. And he makes effort, stir up his energy, exert his mind, and strike. Right, so, so this one uh, we call uh, anurakana padahana, and view to maintain. So Anguttara Nikaya says, keep firmly in the mind a favorable object of concentration that has arisen. So now we look at these uh, seven factors of enlightenment. So these are the prerequisites for your final attainment. Right, it talks about the mindfulness, investigation of Dharma, talk about energy, talk about rapture, talk about the tranquility, talk about concentration, and talk about the equanimity. So we shall look at investigate them, you know, one by one, what are these, and then there are way to abandon them. Or uh, way to yeah, to you know, <clears throat> giving strength to it. Um now the first one is the enlightenment factors of mindfulness. 
Okay, so generous statement like this. What is mindfulness? Uh, is it is the insight into the nature of things by bringing to light phenomenal in the now, the present moment, right? So now, um, you see, in the in a lot of descriptions uh, of this uh, Satabhajanga, you will find the similar, you know, four kind of uh, attention of the enlightenment factors of mindfulness. It, it says that, you know, uh, when the enlightenment factors of mindfulness is present within me, oh no, sorry, they say, when the enlightenment factors of mindfulness is present within him, a bhikkhu should understand the enlightenment factors of mindfulness is present within me. Okay, so this is a one attention. The second, when the enlightenment factors of mindfulness is absent from him, he understand the enlightenment factors of mindfulness is absent from me. This is second attention. And the third attention is, he understand how the enlightenment factors of mindfulness that has not yet arisen within him comes to arise. And the fourth attention is, he understand how the enlightenment factors of mindfulness that has now arisen is developed and perfected. So, a practitioner, uh, in fact, uh, you know, apply this uh, wise attention, you know, to these factors and similarly to other six types of enlightenment factors, in order to increase, to expand, you know, to develop and complete the enlightenment factors, right? So. So now we look at, um, you know, the four things that lead to the arising of enlightenment factors. Uh, these are probably uh, the reference uh, for you all. Huh? So they are very, very straightforward. Uh, particularly in this text, in this part, it says that mindfulness with with clear comprehension. This mindfulness with clear comprehension it means that when someone uh, meditate, you know, he is being mindful. It means that with sati together with sampajana or sampajanya, clear comprehension. It means that, for example, when one meditate, he knows the object, he is mindful, uh, you know, uh, of the object, but at the same time also, he, he also quite uh, comprehend uh, um, of the object. For example, as you breathe in, you are aware you are breathing in, Right, this is comprehension. As you breathe out, you're aware that you are breathing out. So this is the comprehension. So once you have your your object, you know, fixed, being mindful in the present moment, but you also have the comprehension of what you are doing, you know, from moment to moment. And the second, um, avoid people you know, with confused minds and association with people who are established in mindfulness and inclination towards the mindfulness, right? So you had to make your mind, you know, incline, you know, to this mindfulness, to this sati, to this factor, and strengthen it, you know, make it stronger and stronger. So now we look at the second one, investigation of Dharma, right? So it's a factor of investigation, right? Searching out the characteristics, you know, conditions and consequence and analyze, you know, to uncover their fundamental structures. It's like, you know, when you talk about a person, right? A person. In our mundane language, you call a person. But in when you investigate what is a person, then you will discover that it's a person is a is 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 composed of the five aggregates, right? You have the metta, uh, rupa, vedana, sanchkya, sanskara, and vichyana. As you analyze like that. You see, you are involving, you know, the investigation of the Dharma. You analyze, you know, all this, you know, um, uh, so-called person into these five individual discrete elements. Okay, now we look at six things lead to the arising of enlightenment factors, okay? Uh, we shall look at them. Yeah, it says that inquiring about the aggregates and so forth. It means that, uh, you know, now today we can easily, you know, go go to books or we can easily Google, uh, you know, try to find out the meanings of, you know, the aggregates, for example, or the dhatus, the elements, four elements, 
or you can easily you know get to know about the 12 you know uh, you know the sense basis ayatana all the controlling faculties or the power or you know seven factors enlightenment and what are these you know the jhana angas jhana factors and uh, you also you know what what is uh, samatha and what's the vipassana and of course uh, you also can ask from a monk you know to explain you know the profound meanings uh, in the fine Nikaya's teachings and their commentaries right that's why you know if you don't understand the teaching you know you find it hard to practice and you should you know go to look for teachers yeah and of course now with the advanced technology it's easier for you to look for you know online and the second one is the purification of the basis namely uh you know the cleaning of the body clothes and so forth so the purification of basis is a cleaning of the personal basis the body and of the impersonal basis like clothes uh, drilling you know dwelling places for example it says that you know the flame of a lamb is unclear because it's weak the oil and container are dirty uh, but when the flame of a lamb that has a clean wick huh? oil and container uh, which are cleans then eventually you know it burns brightly something like that so it says that the knowledge that arises under the clean condition is necessary huh? it's, it's very important so we have to keep you know our um, keep clean huh? our body as well as the clothes you know etc etc yes yeah, so and the third uh balancing the five spiritual controlling faculties and why are these five they are the faith mm. right sadha virya mean the effort right and the sati mindfulness samadhi concentration and the wisdom they are to be balanced right so <clears throat> and the four um avoiding the ignorant you see again but that says we have to stay away from the foolish people who don't understand the teachings of the buddhas right and associating with the wise right engage in dharma studies such as you know studying of five um, grasping or aggregates you see or the dhatus ayatanas etc etc is engage in the dharma studies but what we are doing it now of course it's a bit very lengthy and probably many people will find bold particularly in the afternoon yeah, but anyway they are very important you see before we go for a meditation a basic understanding of what it is is very important if not we don't know how to proceed right and then again reflecting on the profound difference of the heart to perceive processes of the aggregates element sense basis and so forth you see again it talks about you know we have to you know understand you know what are these profound teachings right and again the last one is a mind inclination it means that you know bending your mind towards the investigation of, of dharma so it means that other than the some other than the training of the mind like you know the practice we need also to go to the Dharma studies. We need to go to the investigation of the Dharma, the study of aggregates, etc. Now the third energy, right? Energy. Okay, so then it talks about 11 things that lead to the arising of the enlightenment factors of energy. Uh, reflecting on the fearfulness of state of wool. Yeah. Apaya, bahaya. Uh, state of woman, like in the hell, in the hungry ghost, right? Animals, you see. So these are the, uh, you know, the state of woo. Uh, so if you reflect on this, uh, then, you know, for a practitioner, you see. Then you have the thought like, uh, now I should, you know, uh, practice hard. You see, uh, you know, to arouse the energy. If not, you see, I will, you know, reborn, you know, in one of these states.
this and continue my suffering there. So it seems that there is this urge, you see, if I don't practice, if I don't practice well, you know, when I die, I will go to one of these woeful states, right? So there is an urgency of it and fear of reborning into these woeful states. And the second, seeing the benefits of energy. Okay, the benefits of energy. It means, uh, you know, when you talk about someone who put an effort into the, the, into the practice, that he will attain into certain stages of, uh, you know, uh, super mundane, you know, states. Uh, like, for example, you know, the first jhana, you know, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, like that. And attainment into these uh, different stages, right, can only be obtained when someone really put an effort into it. And it is impossible for one who is lazy, right? So, and the third, <clears throat> uh, reflecting on the path to be walked, right? So the practitioner says to himself, mm, the path walked by all the Buddhas, by the Pachika Buddhas, or by the great disciples of the Buddhas. You see, they are to be walked by you. Yeah? And it is impossible to walk that path if you are lazy. Right? You got to walk you know, by yourself. Yeah? So, so this is reflecting on the path to be walked, huh? because these are the path walked by all the great teachers, by the Buddhas, by the Pachika Buddhas, by the Arahat. Huh? If you are lazy, then you cannot walk that path, right? Then the fourth, honoring the arms. <clears throat> so when you talk about honoring the arms, you see the practitioners, you know, where things dust, those who support you with arms, food, and so forth, they are not your relative. They are not your servant, you know, but the gift, you know, they're expecting great fruit, you know, from the offering. Also, the requisites were not allowed uh, uh, to you by the Buddhas to be used to have a strong body and, you know, live comfortably or, you know, nourishing your body. But they were allowed to you uh, to do the duty of the Samana and escape from the realm of suffering. And the lazy one, you see, does not honor the arms. You see? So once he arousing, you know, energy, you know, honor it, huh? then reflecting in this way, right, honoring the arms, you know, that produce the energy. Right? So, and then the fifth one, reflecting on the greatness of the heritage. When you talk about the greatness of, of the heritage, you are talking about, uh, you know, the heritage of the teachers, you know, who possess uh, Sata Arya uh, Dhana. It means that uh, uh, great teachers, you know, who possess the seven treasures. It means that they cannot be obtained by one who is lazy. Uh, lazy people uh, uh, cannot obtain it, right? So, only the main, you see, uh, of energy, you know, do deserve to get this, you know, the, 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 the heritage of the five, of the seven treasures. And the sixth, the greatness of a teacher. You see, you think of the Buddhas who has achieved many things in his lifetime, uh, you know, from birth to renunciation, enlightenment, and then turn the wheel of the Dharma and preach Dharmas, you know, even in the 33 Tawatimsa to his mother and attain Mahaparnibbana. You see? Or you can think of he has already perfected the Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. You see? So the teacher, our teacher, you see, Buddha was such a great person. You see? So reflecting on the greatness of the teachers. And the, last, and the seven, reflecting on the greatness of the lineage. What is lineage? Uh, 
we are talking about you know once you become you know uh, the disciple of the buddhas you are you are the son of the sakya you see you are the son of the sakya and for those lazy uh, they are not qualified to be called the son of sakya so we are very proud because we are the sons of the buddhas you know we are the sons of the sakyas so this is our lineage, right? So lazy people won't get it. And number eight, reflecting on the greatness of companion in the holy life, right? So think of the, the chief arahat, you see? So for example, like Sariputtas, Moglanas, and great teachers, you see, they have penetrated the super mundane a path, you know, after much, you know, the interviews, you know, efforts. Uh, you can ask yourself, are you following the way of life, right? So, number nine, again, okay, avoiding lazy people. It means that you're avoiding, you know, people, um, you know, lazy people, right? So, and number 10, associating with people who exert himself. You know, it means the association with those, you know, uh, people whose mind, you know, turn towards, you know, to the attainment of Nibbana. <clears throat> and of course, the last one is inclination as well. Huh? So you towards your mind, you know, you incline your mind towards uh, a development of the factors of energy. So these are... Yeah? And the fourth, the rapture pity. And I believe you have heard of the words, uh, you know, in Chinese we call it fasi. Huh? It means that Dharma joy, fasi chong ma, it's like Dharma joys, you know, filled everywhere. Huh? And that is the joys derived from the process of settling the mind. So once we have the joys, we we have to find ways, you know, to strengthen, to increase, to expand, to develop, and to complete it. Complete it. So this Nama Joy is very essential in our practice, right? Without which there is no way, right? So it is a very important ingredient for our cultivation, Dharma Joys. So now we look at 11 things that lead to the rising of the enlightenment factors of rapture. Okay, now we look at the one, two, three. It's a recollection of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So when we talk about the recollection, you are recollecting the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sanghas. You see? <clears throat> okay, so uh, we have no time to go through, you know, what are the qualities of this? Yeah? But anyway, um, we shall look at it other day. Yeah? But the recollection of virtue, this is also uh, recollecting, you know, the, the sila. You see, reflecting on your, your unbroken virtue, yeah. Or even for lay people, you also can con uh, you also can contemplate, right, on this, right, through your observation of the what do you call five precepts, eight precepts, and ten precepts, and then your cultivation and your practice is unbroken. And number fifth, recollection of generosity. Yeah. So like contemplating of giving food, fine food to other companions who are in need of food, you know, during a difficult times of famine and the like. So when you recollect like that, you know, you see, it arises, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, the joys, you know, the raptures, you know, recollecting like that. You see, or you can also, you know, like giving, giving, uh, you know, generous, I mean, giving, recollecting the, the generosity, you know, in giving alms to the virtuous people. When you think back also, you feel joyful. Okay. And then, of course, like devas, you see, similarly also, when you talk about the devas, you see, you're recollecting. So these are what we see, you know, is six qualities under this anusati, a recollection. Huh? And then recollection of calmness. Huh? So it means that, uh, you know, you're keeping alive with peace, with morality, concentration, wisdom, right? 
So in this way, when you contemplate like that, you know, your deformance will become less and then your life will fill with more joys, right? And number eight, avoiding the coarse people. It means that you are keeping away from the rough people and who have no faith in the Buddha, in the Buddha and the like. And because these people, they don't respect uh, you know, the Sanghas, you know, they don't go to the temple, they don't worship the shrine and respect the elders to try to avoid them. And of course, associating with the culture people. Yeah. And what are these? What, what, is, what is the quality of culture people? It means that they have, these are the people they have who has faith in the, in the Dharma. And then, of course, his mind is very soft and gentle. <clears throat> and then, uh, reflecting on the discourse, inspiring confidence, right? So, yeah, inspiring confidence in the triple dreams, right? In order to overcome the fear and the worry. And the last one, the also inclination. You see, we have to train our mind inclined towards enlightenment, right? So by cultivating it again and again. So the fifth is strangulity, prasati, right? Is it strangulity, the rapture. So here is seven things that lead to the rising of the enlightenment factors of tranquility. So, okay, eating food. Food is very important, right? Uh, so the fine food here means, you know, very excellent food, very beneficial food, and that suit one in the cultivation, right? And... Of course, you know, when you have enough food, you see, that gives you strength for the cultivation. And of course, if your body is, 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 is strong, you know, you can sit a bit longer. Huh? And of course, we are talking about we don't attach to it, but, you know, our body is made of, you know, uh, our body requires, you know, this, this quality of food. If the, the food quality is bad, right? then our body will become very weak and cannot sit for long. And they cannot you know, stay long in meditation, right? I hope you understand what I'm saying. And uh, seeking out comfortable weather. Uh, you see, when you had a comfortable, comfortable weather and posture, you see, we combine these two, you see, um, it means, um, you know, you need to have a good, good weather, you see, and good postures, right? And that caused you know, the tranquility, you know, your body tranquility and the mental tranquility. You say, for instance, in a place it's so hot, and how your mind is it's not peaceful, it's not tranquil, right? And the posture is also very important, right? So you have to find a posture that suits you. And the judgment according to the middle way. What is this? Judgment according to the middle way. <clears throat> when you talk about the middle way, then you have to understand, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call reflection on uh, one's own deed as one's own property, right? And you had to understand the law of karma, yeah? and <clears throat> um, everything is due to karma, you know. So you know people. Uh, they, were, they, they have a thought like, you know, oh, I experienced an unpleasant feeling. That is because, you know, I'm punished by the God. Right? So when you talk about this middle way, you see, you are talking about knowing of all your suffering and happiness, you know, due to your own karma. Or not by, you know, the externals, you know, the, the creator God, and things like that. <clears throat> Avoiding people who are physically restless, Right? So it means they stay away from those restless people, you know, who go about harassing others. And people who are physically calm, you know, are those who are physically restrained and quiet. And the last one is inclination towards the developments. So, <clears throat> and then now we look at number six, concentration. I hope you understand the concentration. It's a one-pointed uh, pointed unification of mind. So also there are, you know, proposed 11 things that lead to the rising of concentration, like purification of the basis. I think for one who meditates, he has to keep, you know, things, his body and the things surrounding clean, 
right? Including the cloth, including the drilling places. So these are the purification of the basis, is the cleaning of the body, etc. Say like if one stay in a very dirty environment, the knowledge that arises from his mind, you know, and the mental factors also will not be pure. If one live in a clean environment, then the knowledge and that arises is also pure. Okay, so the second balance of the spiritual controlling faculty, talking about this five, uh, like faith, faith effort, you know, they have to be balanced. And skills in taking up the characteristics of the object of meditation, right? And then inciting the mind where it is necessary. When you talk about inciting the mind, when it is what is inciting the mind? It means that you know you are you are you are arousing your mind rigorously, vigorously by reflecting on these at things. It means that you arouse a sense of urgency. You know, for example, like birth, old age, disease, death, the suffering of the full world who says the samsari rounds of suffering in the past, the suffering rooted in search of food in the present life. So you can think, you know, time is not waiting for us. So there is this agency uh, to, you know, to, to practice, you know, to cultivate, right? And then restraining the mind when it is necessary, okay? So the last one, cleaning the mind when it is necessary. When your mind is not happy, you know, you, it's no way that you attain the concentration. So you have to keep it all time, you know, smile, you know, free, you know, with ease of mind and a smile. Right? Okay. Oh, and now, some more. Watching the mind without interfering when it is necessary. Okay. So avoiding people who are not focused in mind, right? And associating with people who are collected in mind, right? It means that who are, you know, or who have reached, you know, those states of concentration, associate with them. And reflecting on the absorp absorption and liberation, uh, reflecting on those. And the last one is also inclination, you know, for these factors, you see, inclining and bending towards concentration. Okay, now we look at the last, the seven factors of enlightenment. That is equanimity, you know, inward equilibrium and balance, quality of non-looking. Mm. Now five things lead to the rising of the enlightenment factors of equanimity. Mm. The first one is the detached attitudes towards being. Uh, you see, when you talk about the detached attitudes, you know, towards being is brought about by the reflection on beings as owners of their own deeds and by reflection in the ultimate constituents of the phenomena. Uh, you can also reflect like this, okay? You have been born here is because of your own deeds in the past and you will depart from here according to your own deeds. Who then? You know, is the being you, you you are attached to. So if reflecting on like this, okay, and you know, or you also can think like, you know, we are saying like, uh, what do you call, reflecting on the ultimate constituency, you know, of phenomena, you see? Then you also can say that ultimately when I analyze all these things, you know, there is no being, you know, and to whom then, you know, can you be attached to, you see? So, this equanimity and detached attitudes towards things, yeah? So you can reflect on the no ownership and the nature of temporaliness, you see? For example, you know, contemplating on the ropes, you see? The ropes, you see, so beautiful, uh, you attach to it. But once you, un once you contemplate like this, you know, you will soon be fed and getting old, and then you, you can turn the, the cloth into a food cleaning rack or later on thrown away. You see, so and avoiding people who are egoistic in regards, huh? and associating with people who are neutral, right? Impartial in regards to living beings and things, and inclination for developing the enlightenment factors of equanimity. Okay, so because the times not allow me uh, to say, uh, so uh, we have to you know move forward quickly, huh? 
And mindfulness initiates a contemplative process, right? So uh, when mindfulness becomes well established, it arouses investigation. Investigation in turn call for energy. Energy gives rise to rapture. Rapture leads to tranquility. Tranquility to one point yet concentration and concentration to equanimity. Right? So it says, it says when any one of these factors arises, its presence should be noted. So after noting their present, one has to investigate to discover how it arises and how it can be matured and strengthened. <clears throat> okay, so consistency cultivation, you know, for all these, uh, you know, factors and enlightenment is very important, right? Okay, so I, I will leave it to any question. Imang no punya bagang mata pito nanjem acharya nanjem sap sat nanjem sap mit nanjem Baje mam sabe satam sukita hondu. By these meditatory seeds that I have acquired today, may all beings, parents, teachers, friends, relatives, brothers, and devas share my merits. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.